get above the rules, get above the policies, uh, make your own private policy, be that, be that samurai, be that kind of person that, that becomes so ingrained in doing your job well that nobody can really bug you about it because you're in the right. Hey guys, check out the 2023 Street Cop Conference, April 23rd through the 28th, Gaylord Convention Center. It's going to be the event of the year. Keynote speakers include Rob O'Neill, the guy who killed Bin Laden, Kyle Carpenter, the youngest living Medal of Honor recipient, Navy SEAL Jason Redman, Fox News host Tommy Lahren, Marine Corps Special Forces and Leadership Coach Cody Alford, Sheriff Wayne Ivey, Sheriff David Clark, and Sheriff Mark Lamb. It's going to be one hell of an event. And on top of that, we have all of our instructors and additional instructors from other companies going to be at the event, giving you everything they know for you to have a successful career and get the results you want to get in the field as a police officer. On top of attending the event, you'll get face-to-face time with every instructor attending the event, and all the keynote speakers will spend time with you. we got special events all week, giveaways, nightlife. It's going to be really, really worth your time, energy, and effort. I promise you, you will not regret it for a second. To register for the conference, check out streetcop.com, click conference, and everything you need will be there on the homepage. If you are looking for a room, just click book a room. The block has been sold out at the Gaylord Opryland Convention Center. But there are many hotels nearby within a walking distance of the event. You don't want to miss out on this opportunity. We will see you there. And is there anything you particularly you want to talk about today? Um, I don't know how much context you have of us, but anything that's on your mind lately or something that you would like to discuss that correlates back to us or in current affairs, previous stuff. I, I did go back and cause my youngest son's a police officer and my oldest son was in law enforcement and uh, air force OSI for a number of years. He's a physician now, but uh, so there was this brief moment in time where I had just retired and my youngest son was in the Academy and my oldest son was still OSI. And so we had like this, like maybe a two week period where, we all three had badges. It was pretty cool, but we get in conversations a lot about how hard it is to be in law enforcement today. And why would anybody do that? My family and I are all in the let's, you know, somebody needs to do it and it should, why not me? Why not us? So, you know, if you want to go that route, cause I think what you guys do is really phenomenal in professionalizing and keeping the law enforcement more than just a job, but a, a, a true profession, which I, I believe it's a, it's a calling. So, and, and I hope that comes across in the books. It is a true profession in the sense that I think any time you work in a job that the likelihood of you losing your life is significantly higher than any other profession or very few professions in the world, you have to treat it as a profession because you have to be a master of your craft to, at a very minimum, preserve your life. Yeah, absolutely. I my, I tell a story periodically, but so when my youngest son, he's in his 30s, so he's not a kid, but he's, uh, to me, he's a kid. Uh, <clears throat> he was actually born while I was at the Marshall Service Training Academy out on a one of the, one of their quote unquote fun runs, you know, one of their eight mile formation runs and the golf cart pulled up next to us and said, uh, fall out. We're having a baby, you know, and they were like, you're going to go home. And I was like, you know, I knew this was going to happen before I, I got here. This isn't a surprise to me. That's not how pregnancies work. But, um, so, you know, I can gauge my martial service career with, from when he was born. And so he's always been kind of interested in it and following my, you know, war stories and whatnot. So when he got on with Anchorage police department, I was pretty proud of him. And uh, we talked about, you know, he went through FTO, which everybody knows is the the gut punch of, of any law enforcement training is just going through that, you know, hazing period, a training period of, of FTO. But I was still fine with that. And then he went off on his own for the first time on mid shift, you know, got cut loose. And I was a nervous wreck. I mean, I was just beside myself, my, my, kid out there by himself and Anchorage can be a a pretty violent city after midnight and especially in the winter when he started on his own when it's you know basically 20 hours of dark and so I was pretty pretty wound up and I looked over at my wife and she was fine 
she was absolutely fine with it. She was relaxed and, you know, just living life. And I, I was kind of taking it back. And I said, what's the matter with you? What, what, how could you be this way? This is our baby. And she said, Mark, this is new to you. I've been doing this for 30 years. And it really was a, an eye-opening experience to me. And, I, and I've had this conversation with both my sons. You know, it, it's not just us that are in law enforcement. It's the, it's the whole family. I knew you were going to say it as soon as you were going to bring your wife into it. And, uh, you know, even me now not being in the field anymore, but having people that obviously I know and I care about that are in the field. You know, I try, I guess, in the same sense, not my kids that are in my kids are significantly younger than yours uh, at this point. But, you know, I, I have people that I care about that are in the field. And I think I just kind of uh, tune it out. And for us, to a parent listening to yourself, I don't know if your children are exposed to, or your son who's now continuing to be in law enforcement is exposed to what we do, but we're trying to ease your worries a little bit. And that's kind of some of the the work that we do at this company as well, because we are trying to, again, at a very minimum, reduce the likelihood of somebody losing their life in this profession. Um, unfortunately, in the 700 to 750,000 law enforcement members in the United States of America, and globally, God knows how many, I haven't gotten to everybody yet. And and as weird as it sounds, even though we have the internet, it has seemed to almost been like a virus that has spread across the country from the East Coast over to the West Coast. We're having some real penetration on the West Coast, but the West Coast now feels like the East Coast did seven, eight years ago. So, yeah, I just had a guy from the California Highway Patrol send to me, and literally before I got in this podcast, maybe 10 minutes before on Instagram. I can't make this up. Um, this is what he wrote to me. You know, these are things I don't really need reminders anymore of why we do the work that we do. He said, thank you. I follow you guys often. Have already attended the case law course and interdiction mastermind. You guys are doing great things. And trust me, you guys are making a difference. That's good. good so, to, to yeah, it's good to hear. It's great. But also to... The parents out there, maybe it gives you a little peace of mind if you know your son ever gets to take some of our courses and get his professional skills even better. Maybe it provides a little bit of a comfort. I've never thought of that until this moment. But yeah, that's interesting. no, no. I, I think any kind of training, I, you know, the street survival training was just coming online back when I was first starting. And I remember the brass, you know, the chief and the, the assistant chief. They didn't really want us to go because they thought it would turn us into, to, you know, wanton killers on the street and make us all paranoid. And I had a, I had a um, mentor sergeant. She's, she's probably one of the best bosses I ever, well, no, probably about it. She's one of the best bosses I ever had rose to the ranks of captain in the department. Everybody called her Ma because she, you know, this was back in the early eighties when there weren't that many females in law enforcement and, she really took a lot of us under her, her wing and um, raised us up. But, you know, I started law enforcement when I was barely old enough to buy my own bullets, you know. And so, but she um, paid my way, paid my, picked me out and said, I'm going to, I'm going to pay your way and drive you over and uh, take you to these trainings. And, and then it sort of caught from there and then training like you guys on street cop and, you know, that, I think the mindset of, I hope that the mindset of management, I know it was when I was in a, a chief deputy with the marshal service, it's the more training, the better, the more training, as you said, the more training, the safer, it doesn't make you paranoid. It makes you realistic and, and rational. And if you're not thinking about what you, you know, don't, not pay something as simple as the case law and, constitutional law and no having those that knowledge gives you one less thing to worry about when you're out on the street so you can worry about tactics and and things like that so you're not caught and, and pulled in multiple directions when you should be focusing on the incident at hand i never know where my mind's going to go and what i'm going to recollect as i start to continue to i guess unpack my history in law enforcement mm -hmm. um when you bring up this uh Street survival course. I paid my own way to go. Uh, me and a few other guys at the uh, at my police department went, and I, I, I mean, I got to give it up to that that course. It was profound for me, and I, I just 
Remember, we were hung over because it was in Atlantic City, New Jersey, where <laughs> it's just a continuous party. So, I mean, I was I mean, I basically was bombed out of my brains at eight o'clock in the morning or nine whenever the class started. And I got to tell you, I learned a lot from that because they caught my attention. The presenter was very good. And, you know, now I probably see it through a different lens a little bit as, as somebody who runs a police training company uh, and is an instructor as well. But I, there's no question about it that gave me some real perspective on how things should be done because I'd never experienced anything like that before. But it's funny because when we talk about more training makes you better and safer and more professional, and it just continues to get you better at this career. I remember coming back and our command staff knew that we went. They were not supportive of it by any means, believe me. And I came back and I heard this captain who was a young captain. He said, how was, uh, how was street survival? And they had gone years ago. And I said, it was good. He goes, what'd you learn? I go, to love yourself and don't love your agency. Because if you love your agency and when you go to love them, they don't love you back, you're going to go into a significant mental spiral. And Mark, he was so offended by that, you know, because he was a big company man. And they were so fucking right about that. They couldn't have been more accurate about that statement because yeah. they knew what these agencies are capable of when you give everything to them and they literally will kick your fucking face down as flight of stairs whenever they feel like it. And you're like, but wait a second, I love you guys. And they're like, who are you again? Number 46 here. Give a shit about you. And unfortunately that's true, but I used to print out, I now became very adamant. I went to three police academies. So I had a lot of context of what recruit level training was, but I became very adamant about we received something called APB net in New Jersey, which was basically bulletins that came out, wanted people, wanted cars, apprehensions right. and training announcements. <clears throat> they hated sending people to training so much. 200 mid agency had a huge training budget. Every captain and lieutenant and fucking detective went to every training course, every guy in patrol and every sergeant went to nothing because they didn't care about anybody but themselves. And that's a true statement. But I used to print out just to break balls. I used to print out training flyers and put them up. Uh, I'd pin them to a cork board in the muster room. You know, our musters were like anywhere from eight to 20 guys were in a muster five times a day. We had a big agency. I'd put them up every night and every morning I come in, they'd be in the garbage or taken off. Every night I go in, I'd highlight them. I'd start breaking balls. And so I said to somebody who watched the cameras, like, who comes in? They go, the training sergeant comes in in the morning, pulls all the fucking stuff down. He didn't mm -hmm. want anybody to know that there was training available. <laughs> And that's how much I believed in it. And that's how much they tried to stop it. Could you imagine yeah, that's police pretty department sad. trying to stop training? Yeah, that's pretty sad. We're fortunate up here. Uh, Anchorage PD is, you know, every agency has their issues, but uh, the, there's plenty of people on command staff that uh, seem to really care about, you know, I, and that does my heart good because many times for research for the books, I'll, I'll go and I'll uh, work with SWAT. He's a SWAT officer and, uh, I'll go and hang out with them on their training days or for sniper training. And, and I just, it does my heart good to see the, the caliber of young men and young women that are, that are still doing this job. And, you know, as a retired action guy, it, uh, it, it whose son is still in it, 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 uh, it really does my heart good for, for not just me as a dad, but for, for the city and the state and, and all across the country when I, I, for one of the, the Jack Ryan books, I, I did some research in Abilene, Texas. And so I just reached out to him blind on the internet, chatted with their SWAT commander and then traveled down there to meet with him and, and just an absolutely stellar group of people that, that, you know, I wanted a place for, for my own personal reasons because Anchorage PD is APD. I wanted a city that was APD. So when I wrote about this cool team, I could be thinking about my son and his, SWAT team. And it turned out Abilene PD was every bit as stellar. So, you know, I, I just have to think that there's places like that all over the, and, and I know because I do research with Alaska state troopers on the East coast on the, you know, in the, in, um, I was just in South Dakota talking to some of their state officers there really, really gives me hope media coverage, notwithstanding, um, really gives me hope for the future with a, just the, the stellar group that we have in law enforcement today, and including some of the command staff who I generally end up meeting first because I have to get permission. So there is hope anyway, at least from my perspective. I believe there's a lot of hope. 
And I think people need to really, um, you know, account for where they're receiving their information from, because I'm a gentleman who travels this country and I'm very quick to extinguish some of the BS I hear about, like the job's dead. (laughs) Things will never be the same. We have no public support. And I'm like, guys, um, I travel this country and I can tell you, I go to places where these cops can't even buy lunch because nobody will let them. Right. I can I can I can tell you sheriffs who um, reward appropriately and and these chiefs who reward appropriately, they're hardworking men and women. And and it's based on meritocracy and not on nepotism. Um, I can tell you where recruiting efforts are easy for a lot of agencies because they treat their people so well and they understand them as human beings versus just another number in the field to cover this beat. Mm -hmm. And. I also, but I, you know, those aren't the things I need to fix. Mm -hmm. That's not the things that need to get addressed because they're not broken. Those are the things that are the examples. And that's why people like Mark Lamb at Arizona and and my friend Wayne Ivey out of Florida and all these guys that I know who are these big name sheriffs, their principles are the same. So you got to ask yourself a question. Why do people work for Wayne Ivey or Mark Lamb? They have no recruiting issues, essentially. They make less than the surrounding counties and, and people are thrilled and enthused to work for those guys. So we know it's not a money issue. Uh, so we should need to take these guys and use them as an example. And yeah. if there weren't problems, which is basically leadership is the number one complaint in law enforcement, if those didn't exist, well, I'd move on to the next issue. But we know that that is the chief complaint. <laughs> it's all, We hear it nonstop. Leadership, leadership, leadership. And I've, I've made my, my mission clear. I'm not really trying to change those who don't want to change. Uh, I'm trying to grow and and then later on harvest the malleable minds of the upcoming right. next 15, 20 years of law enforcement. So you could tell a recruit, here's what a leader looks like. These are the qualities that they display. Um, I, I'd like to believe that out of that 50 person recruit class, some of them are going to make command staff. They're going to make it to the top. And hopefully they'll keep those beliefs and not forget about what it means to be in that position and, and to ignore the Kool-Aid. I don't drink that kind of Kool-Aid. We have our own Kool-Aid here. Yeah. And we yeah. think it's, we think it's appropriate Kool-Aid. So you can be a leader, especially in police work. When you're out on the street, you can, you can begin your career being a servant leader and then just carry that on. I mean, you know, some of my best mentors never had any stripes on their shoulders. They were all on their arms in terms of longevity and they never were command. But boy, they taught us all and they were they were happier on the street. And um, and then, you know, ho- like as you say, some people moved up that had their head screwed on right from the very beginning. So, yeah, I'm with you on that 100 percent. If we talk about this enough and address it and people don't like to hear it because it reflects how they behave. Uh, I think that once you start getting that worked out more, I think other things start to really trickle down from that. So really. It's a really important part. And, you know, you see it. You see it on the news. We've talked about this. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but on this podcast, uh, you have these chiefs or sheriffs that will show up and pander to the news (laughs) and play the whatever the whatever is good for politics today is what I'll say. And you got guys like Mark Lamb and and Grady Judd out of Florida and Ron DeSantis. And uh, this is not a political conversation. And and Wayne Ivey showing up and saying, we're not here to try to make you happy. Sometimes this job is violent. They shot at our cops. I'm I'm sad they didn't shoot him more. Because you shoot at one of our guys, we should shoot the shit out of you. They literally say this at press conference, like, we're going to shoot the shit out of you. Um, but at the same time, they hold their guys accountable. They don't, it's right. not just some some circus, but there's there's accountability, but also support. And that's a, that that fine mixture is where you really have to land and that's where people thrive the most in these in these professional law enforcement uh, communities. When you do research for a book, what does that look like? Tell me about, before we go into that, and I hate to sound, I don't want to sound atypical of other podcasts. We try to be different than other podcasts. Um, tomorrow we have three MMA champions coming in, well-known awesome. stars in, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And like the last thing I want to do is like do the same fucking interview they did 83 <laughs> times before this one. You know, as, as you started your career, when did you start writing? Well, I've been writing my whole life. So I, you know, okay. I knew I knew when I was very young I wanted to write someday. And you know, I mean, well, and I was writing, but I knew I wanted to make a living as a writer, but I also knew I wanted to make a living in law enforcement. 
And so, you know, I, I tell this story all the time, but my, I broke it to my wife that I wanted to be a, a cop and a writer. She, she thought I wanted to be a college drama professor and a writer, you know, we met in the theater and school and, um, but she married me anyway. And that first year of marriage, I got a job with a local police department and she bought me when I was making $6 and 67 cents an hour. And she, uh, this is in 1984 and she bought me somehow got the money together to buy me a, a ballistic vest. One of those old American body armor, you know, there's no protective cover on the outside. It's just, you, you know, wipe it off with a sponge, kind of a quite heavy, big metal trauma plate in the front. Ballistic the outer vest. all goes on the outside of your uniform. Well, no, this, this went on the inside, but it, it, uh, it was just one of the early ones, you know, that had, it had a picture of an armadillo on the front of it with a bullet bouncing off. And um, <laughs> anyway, and in Texas, you know, that was a, a rough place to wear body armor at the time. So I, I was one of the few on the department that had them to begin with. They didn't issue. And then probably about three years on my career, they issued. But anyway, my, um, my wife bought me a, a American body armor, ballistic vest and a Smith Crone electric typewriter. And this was in 1984. And she said, now go do your dreams, you know? And so she really supported me along the way. And I wrote for probably 20 years without ever getting published, you know, going to the mailbox and, you know, weeping and wailing and all right, write another one. No, they don't want this one. And then finally about 20 years on, I sold a short story and, and uh, I remember she met me at the, at the door with a rolled up newspaper or rolled up magazine and swatted me on the butt and said, you know, go write us a couch. This is this. I think it was like seven hundred and fifty bucks. You know, go write us a fridge. This is working out good. And then that would have been um, in the early two thousands, and uh, just started writing as while I was still a deputy marshal. I was I got permission to write on my off time, and um, ended up writing probably about three, four, five, six, probably six books. Um, some of them ghost written. You know, I wrote for another author my name didn't appear on the book and then a couple under my name, a couple of Westerns under the name, Mark Henry. Uh, and then, cause that was my fictitious ID when I was in North Idaho and then wrote, started the Mark Cameron line, uh, Jericho Quinn novels and was able to retire right when I turned 50 and just kind of seamlessly without any drop in pay, just went from being a deputy marshal or chief deputy marshal um, about 10 years ago to writing full time. That's awesome. You know, uh, there's a lot of stuff to, to unpack there before I go into some additional questions that I have, because I, I certainly admire tenacity and I want to go there with that <laughs> and that mindset. But um, because I think tenacity is important and I think it's some reality of when somebody looks at somebody who has some success like you and the the amount of books that you've written and how successful those books have been and say, well, it must be an easy thing. <laughs> I just heard it from the man himself 20 years without a person essentially given a half a shit about anything that he's doing. Fuck, we might as well answer the question now. What made you keep doing it? You know, what, what, what were you telling yourself in your head during those times? Tell me about the ups and downs of that. Well, you know, I, I think it's a compulsion. It's, it's you, you know, tenacity, compulsion, you know, just bullheadedness. I, uh, I enjoy the creative process. I enjoy writing. My wife and I always joke, you know, if, I, if, if we won the lottery, I'd keep writing until all the money ran out. You know, um, <laughs> I... I uh, when I was in high school, I had a very difficult English teacher. I mean, she was super hard, but great, great teacher. Well known as one of the hardest teachers in the school. And I turned in a, a creative writing assignment my junior year. And, you know, this was when you were supposed to type stuff if you had a typewriter, but not everybody had a typewriter, in the, you know, in the mid or late 70s. And but you at least had to write it in pen. And I turned this in. I I it was in pencil. There was a lot of misspellings. It was poorly, you know, it, it just, it just was not a very good piece of work. And so I got a C on it. Got a C, C minus. And my dad was a school teacher. So a C minus was, a, you know, that was equivalent to an F in my dad's mind. So there's red marks all over the paper, but at the top corner of the paper in pencil was written, Mark, this looks publishable to me. So she edited it and, and gave me what I did, the grade I deserved. But then this hardest teacher in high school said, I think you could get this published. And that 
I, I turned back to that statement dozens of times over my career. Plus my wife read my stuff and she liked it and she would edit it. She still edits it. She is not a, she's not a pushover when it comes to, uh, to editing my stuff. She knows it's a business. And so she'll call me when I need to be called. But, uh, and, and I, I've taken over the course of 25 books now, published books, um, I've never not taken her advice, and it's it's uh, served me well, I think. Hey, guys, if you're enjoying the Street Cop Podcast, do us a favor and go with, give us a review on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're listening to us. Tell a friend. We don't charge anything for the episodes. We appreciate your support. Check us out on any social platform by putting into the search bar, Street Cop Training. Give us a follow. We have a lot of free content coming out every single day that you might not catch here on the podcast, and it's important for you to be able to do your job more professionally, and we also entertain you as well. Did you ever tell that teacher or an opportunity later on to say that moment changed my life? I did. I, I was able to dedicate one of the early Jericho Quinn books to her and another teacher and got it in her hands about three months before she passed away. Oh, so that's it amazing. Was, it was, yeah, was, and I'm still friends with her son now, or face, on Facebook with her son now. We, we, he was quite a bit younger than me, but we connected via social media and now we we chat periodically. She was, she's just a, a great influence on my life. It's amazing when people have an opportunity to in, to actually have impact on somebody. They take the opportunity to do that and give a shit what oh, yeah. it really does for somebody in the future. Uh, you know, you you don't realize that if you have an opportunity to really let somebody know that there's something very special about them that can really have an impact. And even though you had this cop itch to scratch, uh, you didn't forget about that moment. And you know, it's interesting. I there are not many teachers in my life that had a lot of impact. Um, something similar. I had a uh, teacher of mine, his name is Steve Mady, And I think everybody who had him really liked the guy. You know, he just, he was this maybe 130 pounds soaking wet. He looked like he hadn't changed his, his, his you know, this is uh, now I'm, I'm uh, significantly younger than you. I'm, I'm in my forties now, but uh, this is in the late nineties. And he looked like, literally he wore the same goddamn outfit from the seventies when he started teaching. <laughs> and, um, he's one of those guys. And I, listen, I graduated class clown. I was why I entertained everybody in school. I wasn't a bad kid. I wasn't a criminal. I was just your typical, like, I don't give a shit about school type of guy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Paul, I, I worked, I liked to work. So I had a job and yeah, I might've dabbled with some things here and there, like everybody else did. And I was a popular kid. And, but I kind of like, uh, I was almost like the Ferris Bueller of my of my school. I don't think anybody would dispute that. Uh, if they if they would have, they would have elected me the class clown. And I'll never forget he said something to me. And uh, and again, here we are sparking a memory. I've told this story recently, but not publicly. Uh, in the hallway one time, I, I can remember it vividly. Second second floor of uh, the high school I went to. And I came down. He said, "Let me talk to you for a second, Benigno." So he's called me. My last name's Benigno. Come here. <laughs> he goes, "You know, I I I watch you." around this place. I watch you all over this school. He goes, and I got to tell you, doing this a long time, you're, you're like a fox around here. I go, what do you, I go, what does that mean? He goes, you're just keen. He's like, you, I've never seen anybody operate in this school. Like the way you're operating. He goes, you just are, you're slick, man. You are sly. You're keen. You're slick. And he's like, it's, it really is something to watch how you operate around this school. Especially, I saw you in junior year, I had you. And now in your senior year, like you literally, he's like, you were just something about you. I always think about you. Yeah. So, I, you know, it's just, I, I guess I could relate to your story and I don't mean to be. No, when you, uh, when you have a, here. when you have a, a teacher that pays attention to you and sees you for who you are, my wife's a retired teacher and, you know, we've lived in the same town for 25 years and so many of the kids that she had are you know in their mid-30s now and and it's funny we'll go to a grocery store or the bank or the butcher shop or someplace not 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 that long ago it's big old we were in a store together and this big old burly guy with a humongous beard bigger than mine came around the counter and picked her up you know <laughs> Picked her up, you know, his hands beneath her butt cheeks, you know, picked her up, big hug, and and uh, <laughs> just said, I'm so sorry I was such a shit to you when I was in school. And, you know, and then she she taught eighth grade. So that's a really a, a hard time for a lot of kids when they're growing up. And she she uh, she made a big difference in a lot of kids' lives. And it's cool to see that 
around town. So when people run into her wherever, so yeah, they make a, I, I had a, you know, you talk about um, tenacity and whatnot, but I had a college professor that probably was the most influential of any in my life and any of my teachers other than Miss Skidmore, the, the English teacher, but he pulled me aside kind of different from your teacher pulling you aside. He, he was tuning me up a little bit and I was my freshman year of, of college. And he, he was a drama teacher, drama professor. And he said, Mark, I've noticed that you really have a tendency to kind of hang out with the girls and chat and talk with your friends when there's, when there's work to be done. I really think that if you would basically chide me for procrastinating what I needed to do. And I think I had a, I had a lead in one of his plays and he thought I should be, I should be memorizing my lines instead of, instead of joking around. And he said, if you will never amount to your full potential, unless you learn to use those little 15 minute segments of time that everybody else wastes. And I, man, I went home and wrote that down in my journal and I really lived by that sentiment since I was 18 years old. And if I'm on an airplane or waiting for an airplane and everybody else is, you know, playing angry birds on their phone or, or whatever, I'm trying to get something done. And you can, you can write, I've, I'm here to tell you, you can write a whole novel in 15, 20 minute increments over a period of a year. If you, if you, if you work at it. So yeah, they make big difference. Your wife, uh, clearly just even by that story alone, and you think about it, we've all been students how many of us would feel compelled to see a teacher like that and lift them up and say, I'm sorry. And whatever it may be, I'm sure it's not the only, and you said it's not the only time that somebody has no. paid her admiration in public. So, it, you know, it speaks volumes to what it means to others when you care about what you do for them, you know, and, yeah. and your wife apparently took that opportunity and it's a big discipline, even as a law enforcement officer or a teacher, they're kind of cut from the same cloth, even as a nurse, that compassion yeah. goes a long way, that extra love. I was in the emergency room over the uh, about a week ago, rolled a side by side onto my arm, and the extra care that the doctor put into communicating with me, and how he tailored his interaction with me versus his interaction with the guy next to me was two different things. He knew he came in, he gave me a fist bump. He's like, "What we do, brother?" And I'm like, "Yeah, you know, I was taking my kids out on a on a 200 Polaris, and I rolled it, and uh, you know, he went next door, and uh, I heard him talk to the guy just in a whole." But I said to him, because I told him I was leaving. I said, hey, listen, dude, I'm not sitting here with ice packs on my arm. It's Sunday. It's 730. I'm going home. I mean, I, if, if you're telling me nothing's broken, mm -hmm. I have ice at home. Right? And, I'll, and, and he said, well, you can't leave. I said, listen, doc, I teach the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> if there's nothing you're going to do. That's I'm just trying to do you a solid and not be mm -hmm. a dick. And I'm leaving no matter what. And I'm not trying to give you a hard time. And I said to him, I go, mm -hmm. and I got to give you credit. I, I got to tell you, I'm very impressed with you. And I think everybody here should know that, that. I think you're one of the kindest people I've met. I've only known you for about 40 minutes and uh, it means a lot. And if that, and he was really elated by that. Cause you could tell that he does put a lot of that thought into the work that yeah. he does. And that's where that's really a lot of the best. There's actually a lot of placebo theories on doctors who are nice and make you feel like you're getting good care versus ones who actually know what they're doing. Do you know that that's actually a real thing? Oh yeah. Oh no, absolutely. My, like I say, my oldest is a physician now and my, uh, the cop son's wife is a nurse and, you know, we're all kind of in that kind of a, it's a people business. It really is. These are people jobs. And I think that's, you know, there's a reason why you see so many cops that are married to nurses or teachers. It's just, we have the same mindset. My wife and I joked for years that she, you know, she taught eighth grade. So, and I was a deputy U.S. Marshal. So we were both in law enforcement because it's kind of that way. It's kind of that mindset, you know? When you said earlier how much you get done in those little 15 minutes, you know, I think there's a, a real power unlock there if you are trying to achieve things to account for your day. I think every every successful entrepreneur, when they write a book or get interviewed, they talk about how are you accounting for your day? And right. I travel a lot. It's what I do for a living. Um, and on a plane, I'll actually watch people sit there and play online blackjack or solitaire for the whole plane ride. And I'm literally knocking out as much as I can. So you're taking those opportunities uh, in the morning, you know, I mean, you could, here's a funny one. It's been happening lately. We've been getting 
more and more significant podcast guest members. Uh, I, I would say guest member guests because we have a significantly sized podcast now. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, I've tasted the 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 uh, the fruits of this. I've become obsessed and compulsive with it. Where we're top one hundred in the education space, I'm trying. I want to go top fifty. And I'd love to get the yeah. top 25. I've got to be realistic about top 10 because you got Jordan Peterson in top 10. These are some, <laughs> some big players, you know? I mean, Jordan Peterson, you could sit and listen to for about two days and come out like a saint mm-hmm. and just a, a whole brand new human being. But I, I take all these opportunities for this downtime to try to at least self-improve. And people say to me, oh, you didn't know that guy was in that movie? You, he was in like seven movies. Or this girl, she was famous. You didn't know her? She's coming on the podcast. I'm like, guys, I... I mean, I don't watch TV. Mm-hmm. You know, I just don't. I mean, and the only TV I watch is when I've officially decided to turn this off. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you in the sense that you said you could write a novel in these 15 minute increments. You're, you're absolutely right, but it's that discipline. Yeah. How did you learn that discipline? Gosh, I, you know, I think my, my literary agent is, is one to remind me that the, the best muse is a mortgage payment. You know, if it, when you, when you become a, <laughs> When you become a, a writer full time, I retired the right after I turned fifty. So in, in the federal government, if you're if you're a gun toter for the federal government, you have to retire. It's mandatory at fifty seven, but you may retire at fifty. And so that's why you have the, you know the you the cutoff at uh, I think it's thirty seven now. Can't get hired with the federal government as a special agent slash deputy marshal. You know that. 1811 series, unless you're younger than 37, because it's mandatory at, at 57. So I, uh, at, if you got 20 years, you can retire at 50 years old. And uh, so I retired right at 50, which means that my retirement's not that great. Um, I still have benefits. That's, that's phenomenal for a, a full-time writer, somebody that gets to be a novelist full-time, but I have to make my living as a writer. And so that goes a long way to, to make me use those 15 minute increments. And, and, uh, you know, I still, I will get caught up in my grandkids or traveling, you know, go on a research trip and then get caught up in the minutia of it and, you know, skip a day or two of not getting as much writing as I should. I, I almost always write something every day, but it's not as much as I should be getting to, to get to my end. So I don't have to, you know, hit panic mode the last three weeks before a, a deadline. But because I write two books a year, if I'm late on one, that's a domino effect. That means I'm late on the next one, or I have less time on the next one, which puts me less time on the next one. And so I really try hard to to uh, be in charge of my own, you know, output and and stay ahead of the game. And I'm bad at it, but I I. <laughs> work really hard at it. Plus, plus my wife is good about, she'll go to the store and when she comes home, she'll say, how many pages you get done? How many words you get done today? Where are we at in the store? Where are we at in the story now? Kind of a thing. I get that one. Like, you know, I'm I'm, as cliche as it sounds, I'm back on the diet. Right. Um, (laughs) And again, I, you know, people would look at me and say, Oh, you know, you you look fine. Well, yeah, I understand how you perceive me versus how I perceive (laughs) you two different worlds. But just like that, if I got caught snacking at night I, and I could hear the footsteps coming downstairs and I'm like, oh, I'm caught. And, you know, it's like you and, and you know, we're pretty curt. It's New Jersey. You fat fuck. You're down here in the kitchen at fucking 930 at night, 1030, 11. What do you do? You're eating that fucking apple pie. You fat. You ate all that. You mm-hmm. fat motherfucker. You know, so like that's that's love here, as weird as that sounds. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but that's but that's the accountability like your wife does. See, it's very comical uh, how you have yeah. relationships similar. Oh, yeah. When you write books, which is, you know, really very interesting. What's the message that you're always trying to portray in a book? But do you anticipate because you're such a well-known writer that when it's done, it's going to be something worth reading? Well, you know what? I think every book has a little bit of a different message, but I, I'm one of those guys that believes that, that right prevails. And so my books are, I wouldn't, I mean, they're, they're pretty violent. My, my mother-in-law has passed away now, but, (laughs) but she, she read my early books. And um, I remember her telling my wife, she said, uh, Oh, these are so lurid. And I, and I, and I'm, 
I try to write real life, but I try to write real life where good ultimately triumphs. And so I want to see that. I want the I want the reader to come away thinking that okay, good is good is going to come out here in the end. There there are going to be some sacrifices. There's going to be some horrible sacrifices. People might die, but good ultimately triumphs. And and most of my books, I told you earlier that I started writing westerns and most of my books are kind of closet westerns. It's, you know, two, you know, buddies that are, they might ride a motorcycle. They might, you know, they're, they're certainly maybe not be horses, but for instance, the new, um, well, it's not new, but my latest series, the Arliss Cutter series, he carries a revolver. He's, he carries his grandfather's Colt Python, even though the mar- he's a deputy marshal in Alaska and is the marshal service requires us when I got on, we could carry whatever we wanted within certain parameters uh we when we went through the academy we carry we were issued ruger uh gp 100s and then then before that i think they were getting 66s or you know a smith and wesson um, or security sixes i can't remember but um so we got the gp 100 and the next class got the gp 100 i came on in 91 and then after that they went semi-auto but uh smith and wesson 40 six or whatever. I can't remember which one it was. It was the 40 caliber, uh, that stainless 40 caliber double action only, but we could still carry what we wanted. So I carried for a time, I carried a, 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 a Smith and Wesson 44, uh, special revolver. I've carried, I just like revolvers. I'm an old school. I started carrying a 686 and then slowly, and then I moved to a SIG because everybody else, you know, I, I drank the semi-automatic high capacity Kool-Aid moved on to a SIG, and then we all went to Glocks. It was mandated that we went to Glocks. Uh, but this character of mine, Arliss Cutter, in keeping that policy, he carries a baby Glock in the small of his back, and then he carries his grandfather's python. So he's still that, you know, one riot, one ranger, the, you know, the Arizona, you know, the Marty Robbins song, the Arizona Ranger with a big iron on his hip. I want that kind of character, that larger than life character to come in. And sometimes that larger than life character is female. It's not always the, the, the man. There's a, there's a character in, in the books that's his partner named Lola Tariki, who I, my wife and I go to the South Pacific for a couple of months every year. And in fact, most of the Clancy's have been at least half written in a little bungalow in the South Pacific and on the um, island of Rarotonga. Um, and so I met these people down there and, and these wonderful Cook Island Maori people, these Polynesian people. And I want to get their story across. So I'm just and when I write about Alaska, I'm trying to, to tell a story of the, the indigenous people up here and the law enforcement people up here. So if I have any kind of a message, it's just these are the people and this is what they're going through. Let's take a peek at their lives whether it's, you know, and even my bad guys are generally, I hope, three-dimensional so that, you know, I try to write, you know, I, I, I want to write super evil people, even though when I'm interviewed all the time, I always tell people, if I had to count out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of arrests, the evil people I've arrested, I could do it on both hands. That's all it would take. Now, I've arrested a ton of people that have done evil things. So as a writer, I'm generally picking the super evil ones to the bad guys to write about because that's what, you know, that's what your protagonist needs. But I want to, I want to write about real folks. And then maybe on a secondary note, you know, when we watch a a movie, one of my pet peeves is and everybody in law enforcement that watches movies, their significant other probably gets tired of us saying, ah, that magazine would have run out, you know, an Uzi will shoot it, you know, 600 rounds per minute cyclic. So that, that 30 round mag's done in the blink, you know, stuff like that. And they're like, just watch the show. One of my pet peeves is that everybody always racks their, the slide on their pistol as if they're Israeli carrying, you know, that with an empty chamber, every time they get it out, they rack a chamber. And so I make it a point in all my books that my men and women of law enforcement press check but they never rack their gun. They, and so I, I try to put in little training tips, you know, press checks are free, you know, acquire your front sight, 
little things like that so that people that are already in law enforcement go, ah, that's a good idea. I should, I should remember that um, while not beating them over the head with it. I just want to tell a good entertaining story every, every um, with maybe a little bit of, and I don't mind sending somebody to the dictionary either. I read a lot. I, I, uh, Eric Larson is one of my favorite authors. He, uh, the Splendid and the Vile, um, Devil in the White City. You know, you know, I don't know if you've read any of his books, but I have to have a, a dictionary. In fact, I spend as much time reading the the appendices in the back of the book. They're so interesting. The guy's just brilliant. Um, I'm nowhere near that smart or know that near that area diet when it comes to words, but I don't mind if it's a word that I normally use and not everybody else uses it. I don't mind having a reader go to the dictionary. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing at all. What do you think are three important lessons maybe you've occurred from writing or from your, obviously, you're probably one of these guys that I could sit around from and just chop it up with in that room that you're in right now, right? And just turn my phone off and pick your brain a little bit because you have a lot of experience, a lot of wisdom. Um, unfortunately I'm not coming to Alaska right now. It's a little, little frigid for me, even though I'm from New Jersey, it's not, it's not great here. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, you know it was three I, I yesterday. Want. It was three here yesterday, but it's, it's pretty good, up, right? Warmed up in the twenties. Now it's wonderful today. It's toasty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what are three life lessons that you think, uh, or maybe something that typically people don't learn, but are good to know? Um, and it's kind of a, a, a very heavy question because you have to really dig deep into the brain because there's only three there. You probably have 150, but even three that come to your mind now, they're the most significant ones, but three that might come to your mind of like things that everybody should know and it really will help you overall in your life or the lives of others that you that you stand firm on. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, that's a, you're right. It's a deep philosophical question. And I think, you know, my, my kids and I, I have two sons and a daughter and we talk about these kind of things a lot. Um, but I, I, I think in law enforcement, in writing in any walk of life, really, I think it's important that we, we differentiate between reality and what we wish were reality. Uh, a lot of our bad decisions are made because of our, not just our perceptions, we're, we're dishonest in our perceptions and we wish something was a certain way. And so we act like, like for instance, in, in safety, if we really want to go to this concert and it's a bad part of town, we ignore things and we, we wish that we're going to be fine. And most of the time we are, but I think just being aware and being honest um, about our surroundings, about our country, about our, the place we live, about our friends and our acquaintances, I think being being self-aware, but being aware of the situation as well and, and having an honest assessment, I think is important. Um, I would say that as a writer and, and really just as a human being, the, the best human beings I know often, and I can't remember which character says this, I think it's, I think it's John Clark in one of the Clancy books, but I oftentimes I imbue a character with my own sentiment. And I think, in, I think it's him in one of the books that he says, um, the best uh, spies or curious people make the best spies. And in his estimation, the best people. And, and I think that, that it's important for us to be curious about the world around us dovetails into what I said earlier, but, but, you know, and when I go out, you asked a question about research earlier. And when I go on a research trip, if I go somewhere and it's, uh, you know, let's say I went to a, uh, went to Japan or Argentina and I, I wanted to research a particular book. Well, I'll have an idea in mind or Abilene, Texas. I'll have an idea in mind about questions that I want to ask. I'll have these known unknowns, this list of questions, and I'll interview people. Well, if then if I turned around and left when I had all the answers to those questions, I'd be missing out on all the unknown unknowns, all the things that I had no idea to even ask. All the little little nuances of the way people speak, or the little jokes that they tell to one another. I remember sitting in a in a car um, in Argentina, going through a a, um, a toll, 
And one of the, the people we were with said that inflation in Argentina rises like the bubbles of a scuba diver's fart. Well, it's, it's just going up <laughs> so fast. That is not a, a metaphor that I would, I would have used. I wouldn't have even thought of that. But listening to these people and coming up with a, you know, finding these unknown unknowns, it's just, it's like treasure. And I think there's stuff like that to be found all around us. If we'll just be quiet and listen and be genuinely, you know, curious. So often, because I have these questions, especially if I'm on a quick trip um, with the military or something like that, I have these things I need to know about a weapon system or, or, or whatever. And I have to really remind myself, in fact, I'll make a note at the bottom of my, uh, my uh, notepad, be still, be quiet and let them talk, you know, ask questions to engender other, what I want them to do is tell war stories. And I, I went to uh, Washington out on the Olympic uh, Peninsula. I went to hang out with a co- some Coast Guard helicopter pilots there and, uh, they were nice enough to invite me into their day room. And, and really what I wanted to do is just get them chatting with each other and then take notes. Um, but in everyday life, that's what we have to do. It's just, instead of, instead of coming up with, it, it'd be easy for me to, when I'm talking to my son's friends to tell my war stories, but I know what I know already. I want to know what they know and I have to calm down and give them a chance to say it. So that's only two, but that's a lot. <laughs> I think I'm giving Those are good. I think I'm yeah, you know, I, I I made it three just to try to maybe paint some structure behind where you wanted to bring your brain, but that yeah. was no, it was really good. And when you said honest conversation earlier, I think maybe to add to that and maybe offer a little clarification, did you mean that honest conversation was from the eyes of yourself, your own perspective, your own lens? instead of taking everything in from how other people see things. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I, yeah, I would say that, you know, I, I would tell people in class, I would say, you know, guys, right now, what the media is trying to do is create a systematic divide to create controversy, which produces um, good media headlines. So what they're mm-hmm. telling you is that we're racists. As a, com- as a country, mm-hmm. we're racists. You know, how many of you went to the store today and experienced racism at the store? I'm not saying it doesn't exist. But let's, I think by breathing life into this thing is not helping us. You can acknowledge it. You can try not to be a part of it. You can, it can account for your behavior if you think anything. But I think the more that we try to address it, the question is, does it really exist the way that you think it does? And that's one of the beautiful things about this profession is it doesn't matter what you fucking look like. And every cop knows it doesn't matter what you look like, what you got between your legs. You put this uniform on. You take the oath and you're one of us, then you're one of us. I mean, I think there's there's even this extra level of friendship when you have people who are not of the same ethnicities coming together for the same purpose and same cause. I think I think some of the strongest friendships I had were people who are not who did not look like me. Uh, male, female, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, Indian, you name it. Um, so if we really dig deep into our souls, are we genuinely racist people? And the people who are actually acting racist outside of Ku Klux Klan members and some of these really radical, you name it, hatred groups. Uh, when a comment's passed, do you think that's a racist comment truly from the soul of this person? Or do you think they may be a product of their environment? You know, how seriously do you take it? So when you said that, it really struck a chord me because I've been pushing this agenda for a long time. Like it's no different than saying the police work is dead. Well, or you can't do proactive police work. You're going to find you're going to end up in prison or you're going to get in trouble. I can show you thousands of cops that go out every day and do really important work and they're not in prison. And I'm one of them. I never went to prison. Um, hmm. You know, you have to have administrative support, but I think it's a really important message. And I was just wanted to elaborate on it a little bit further that it's OK to 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 not follow the rest of the crowd mm-hmm. and what their beliefs are. You know, I, people might say to me, you know, what's your position on politics? Like, I fucking can't stand them. Um, mm-hmm. My position is I want to make sure cops get good training, go, to, go home to their families, and and there's less victims in society. And, you know, uh, I appreciate what other, whatever side wants to support our mission, because I think it's a very honorable mission that we're on. 
So if you're a Democrat or Republican, as long as you you're you know, I don't you could have your position on a lot of things. I I can agree to disagree with some of the things that you feel. But what we'd like to see is this is my agenda. This is what I push. And um, I think it's a very important message for people to really start being independent thinkers. And especially in a world where it's loaded with people who don't think independently. No, absolutely. I, th- I think that's a that's really important. And, th- and that's what I meant when I said conversation. And I think that the conversation that I'm talking about is internal, that that being honest with ourselves. And and of course, you're in a different well, I guess not really that different. Uh, uh, I'm putting out books, uh, but when when I'm thinking about myself as a writer or, or in law enforcement or as a mentor to to young officers, and and uh, I really want them to to look inside, look deep inside. I like what you said about independent thinking. I think um, too often we get caught up in a kind of an echo chamber where we only listen to people that think exactly like us, where really we should be curious, be curious about what's going on all over the place. Because in at least in my experience, most of my friends are, are pretty moderate people. They're, they're not any one side or, or the other. They're just people that are trying to pay their mortgage. And, you know, they, some of them might have more conservative views on one side, but less on the other. Alaska is a good example where very conservative about some things, very libertarian about, and I'm speaking with a broad brush here, and quite liberal on other things. And so, which I think really sort of is the way most people are. But that, you know, without getting into a political discussion, I think it's incumbent on us as human beings to, to just be curious about everybody. For one thing, it helps you solve crimes. If you're curious about motive, then you're, then you're, trying to figure out what's going on. What's I mean, that makes the, the best interrogators are very curious people who don't speak a whole lot. They let the person interrogate themselves. And so, um, you know, I, I'd done a lot of my work in rural areas where we were, we were tracking as part of the tactical tracking unit here in Alaska. And we we're having a conversation with the ground, watching and learning and listening and picking up and trying to, be aware of of what these tracks, what this sign, what this, you know, it's not always just footprints on the ground, but what this sign left behind is telling us. And you can do that in interpersonal life too. I won't put a number on this last question, but uh, I want to make it a three or a two or a one. But a man who's been around for a while, obviously a very stoic, uh, an author of very successful novels and books and and um, you know, people are very familiar with your work, and I'm honored to have you on. I want to say that again. No, thanks for having uh, 30, me. Yeah, like a 30 year career in law enforcement, essentially. What's some advice that maybe we haven't discussed thus far, or you can repeat the advice that we've discussed even in the beginning about training, whatever you'd like to do. But some advice you could pick one, you could pick three, whatever you want to give to law enforcement officers, and and you could either decide to direct it to very young ones seasoned veterans, everybody as a whole, however you'd like it. But let's uh, let's let's dig into Mark Cameron's brain just for all this experience, pass the wisdom down. What are th- a few things that you would give to people uh, that they should know about being in this profession or entering into this profession? But I'd say probably being in this profession more than anything that you need to remember. You know, I'll, I'll make it an, an analogy here. So as a writer... I think the world has become a, a world of, of critics. We have star systems. We have, you know, you get, you get a review, you get people, everybody wants, some people have made their lives, their, their mission in life now about critiquing other people's work. That's the work they do is critiquing everybody else, which I, I don't particularly agree with, but um, sorry about the clock here. That's my, Wife's antique. I think I, I don't know if there's a more appropriate <laughs> time thing in your in your house <laughs> as an author than that mini grandfather clock going off with yeah. the fireplace and the fucking musket yeah, in the background. People yeah. can't see. Yeah. I don't know if there's. Like, it literally feels like a Charles Charles Dickens novel, and it's supposed to go yeah. off every single. It's very yeah. funny. It fits yeah, you perfectly. So, uh, yeah. Sorry about that interruption, <laughs> but I, but I think, but I I am kind of known among my peers for not going and onto Amazon and reading my reviews. I like 
to get reviews. Don't get me wrong. They drive the Amazon algorithm. So I'm happy to, I, I want people to go on and, and read review or write reviews, but I can't get caught up in them because it's, it's like knowing your own IQ. You can, I can get 50 five-star reviews and I don't believe any of them. If I get one, one star, it guts me for a week. And you know, you suck Mark and this is horrible and you write terrible. And, and it, I, I, it gnaws on me. And so years ago, I quit reading those reviews. Once in a while, my wife will say, Oh, here's a funny one, you know, and I'll, I'll, she reads them. But uh, so at this, so take that now. It's like that Rudyard Kipling point if, you know, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. Anybody that hasn't read that poem needs to read it and take it into account. Um, because it what talks is that about poem? how I, I want to read it. I haven't it's read called, it. It's called If. Just if by Rudyard Kipling. There's always Kipling. Uh, I I allude to Kipling all the time in in my books. I I, I probably reread Kim, um, the book Kim, um, more than I reread any other book except possibly A River Runs Through It. But um, I feel like we've all become, as a society, we've become very critical of others. And I would tell people, don't buy into that. Don't buy up. Don't buy. It's, it sort of goes hand in glove of what we were talking about before. But when you're a young officer and you're getting hammered, especially on FTO, you know, when they might take you to McDonald's and have you fill out an application because you're never going to make it as a cop, you know, there's always some jerk that's going to be the jerk FTO. That might be their job to be the the jerk field training officer. Um, And they're not particularly a bad person in real life. But uh, we get, assailed from all over the place on the street, other officers, command staff, whatever. If there's a way that you can get above it and really like, here are the rules. I'm going to keep that rule and more. I'm going to be a fallout 10 minutes early. I'm going to get, I'm going to be in charge of my own destiny here because it all passes. You can have a jerk Lieutenant and in five years, that jerk Lieutenant, you know, maybe he'll be a captain or she'll be a captain, but chances are they're going to wash out and, and derail their own career. I've seen so many idiots in several different agencies derail after a few years or get stuffed off to the side. Now it happens that they move up, but even so, what kind of hold do they really have on you? You don't get to go to a school. Okay. You don't get to go to a school. You're out here doing one of the most important jobs in the country on the planet, keeping people safe, embrace that. And then you can get above all that other stuff, get above the, the nonsense, get above the politics and uh, focus on the stuff, the good stuff that got you into the, to the gig in the, in the beginning, that would be my, you know, my advice to my kids, my advice to young would be officers and, and advice to folks that I, you know, it's easier said than done, I think, but, um, and, and especially as a, as a, as a former chief deputy where I had, you know, people that would come in and talk to me and I was their boss's boss. It's easy for me to say, cause I'm the boss, you know, but bosses have bosses too. And I had to deal with folks up at headquarters. So, um, yeah, that's probably the the most important thing I could do is just say, get above the rules, get above the policies, uh, make your own private policy, be that be that samurai, be that kind of person that that becomes so ingrained in doing your job well that nobody can really bug you about it because you're in the right. I think to add on to if you employ that, people will also begin to admire you. Yeah, because when you could show that you are not affected by the things that go on here, and you still continue to show up and do your job and do it with compassion and purpose, that uh, it's admirable. And I, I I like to believe that I was one of those people. And I typically f- end class when I teach class with saying, "We get into this thing of how come I didn't get the dog? How come I didn't get mm-hmm. that award? I deserved it." And let me tell everybody that law enforcement is life is not fair. Law enforcement is 10 times more unfair than life. So if you think life is unfair, come be a cop. But if at the end of the day, 
you could look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know, I don't have all this stuff that I don't have a helicopter. We don't have dogs. I don't have a horse. We don't have ATVs that we need. We have, you know, our, our stuff barely works. But I did the best with what I have every single day. And I've gotten better. And you can look at yourself in the mirror at the end of the day and say, I, I really went out and tried to do this job with purpose today. And, and whether that's expressing compassion that you didn't have to express to somebody, uh, taking a little extra time and effort to try to make a change in somebody's life, those extra five or 10 minutes, or spending extra energy in trying to find criminals and, and taking somebody off the street who who belongs behind bars, who is a a, a predator in society. I think that after a career, no matter what's on your shoulders or your sleeve or your hat or on your badge, you will be real proud of the work that you did. And, it, and nobody can take that away from you. And, yeah. and you could just rise above the rest of the BS that everybody's, that everybody's so worried about, you know, I mean, that's it. No, Life isn't fair. Yeah. Absolutely. That I, when I left the PD, I was at, I had this sort of this nemesis, if you will, this, this captain who he and I just never saw eye to eye and a big old heavy set Marine. And for some reason, I always former Marine and I always got his cars hand me down and he was a big dude and the seat was always broken back. And the, you know, and so I, as a young officer, I always got his vehicles. And so I was kind of had a chip on my shoulder because of, of that, because I was always leaning back because the seat was broken. And I had my young punk, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's too fat. And, you know, why, sh why should he be in this job? That lady I was telling you about, Sergeant um, Ma, she got me, her name is Gladys Hansen. Um, she got me aside and, you know, and said, you know, Look at what so and so does. You can learn some stuff from him too. Don't be quite so judgmental. But as I finally got the, I got on with the marshal service, and I was having sort of some, I don't know, impromptu exit interviews. And this particular captain pulled me aside and he said, "You know, I know you don't like me very much." He said, "But I just want to tell you that wherever you go, I'm going to be there. There's going to be a different face with me and a different name, but there'll be another me." That's just the way it is. So the quicker you learn to, to get along with people, the better. And, you know, he was right. He was absolutely right. He was still not somebody that I would want to emulate, but I certainly had a lot to learn from him. And I met plenty of guys like him, you know, throughout the years with my department and my agency and other agencies. There's always going to be people that rub us the wrong way that are just, they just smell bad to our chemical makeup and we might to them, you know, it's just a, just the fact of life. And the quicker we can learn to get, like you said, rise above it, get beyond it. You know, people that, people that when you ask them how their job is and that it's always a negative, there's just always Eeyore. You know, I tell those people, get a different job. If, if you only, if, if all you can say is negative stuff, then find something else that makes you happy. This law enforcement made me happy. I always tell people that writing books is the second best job in the world. I had the best job in the world, and that was being a, a deputy United States Marshal. Now, was there politics? Of course there was. Were there people I didn't get along with? Yes. Um, but the people and the mission were something that I, in fact, my son told me not too long ago, he said, you know, I didn't get in. I didn't want to go into law enforcement because of, of even your cool war stories. I wanted to go in law enforcement because of all the friends you had, because of these this tight knit group of friends that you talked about all the time that are still your friends today. I'm friends with people that I work patrol with 30 years, 30, 40, 38 years ago. We're still very close. So that's what enticed him into looking into the job in the first place. I don't know if we could ever finish it any better than that. And I don't think we should try. No, there you go. Uh, Thanks for this was me. this was wonderful. I mean, really, what a what a different type of podcast we did today. And I always try to go somewhere a little different. And this was great. And I think that you are a wealth of knowledge. And I'm I'm honored to have met you. To be quite honest with you, it's really, no, really. Thanks was for a, having was, me on, and and thanks for what you do. You really are doing a good work out there. Thank you, sir. And and I I enjoyed this experience a lot. It really meant a lot to me sure. today. It really, was a moving thing for me. No, thank you. So, thanks. Me too. This was great. I, and I'm sure we'll be in touch in the future. So yeah, this will not be the last time I see you. And until next time, thank you for being here. All right. Adios. Thanks, Mark.
Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on-demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now, and then you could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher. So you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong, and at the maximum, going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.